Today we continue in the ICU sermon series, looking at the story of Ruth. Join me in prayer. God, we invite you to speak to us through your word this morning. Open our minds and our hearts to hear what you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you can turn your Bibles to Ruth chapter 1. We heard today's reading in the video, but to make sense of the story, we need to start at the beginning. The story of Ruth is set in the period in ancient Israel where the nation is under the leadership of judges. This was before the era of the kings, of Saul and David and Solomon. The book of Ruth was placed in the canon of scripture right after the book of Judges. The book of Judges, you may recall, recounts the faithlessness of Israel. Over and over again, they turn away from God doing what was right in their own eyes. The story of Judges ends on a note of despair, but the short story of Ruth, following right after, hints at hope. In this short, easy to miss book of the Bible, we get a tender story of the loving kindness of God and the empathy and mutual care that flows out of the lives of the people who love God. We'll begin today's story beginning from Ruth chapter one. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons, were Malan and Chilean. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Chilean also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons, and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. In the first chapter of Ruth, we meet two women, Naomi and Ruth. Naomi is an Israelite who has moved to Moab due to famine. While there, she's been widowed and lost both of her sons. We meet Ruth, a Moabite widow. When Naomi shares her intention to return to her homeland, Ruth clings to Naomi and refuses to be left behind. In a devoted act of love, she commits herself to follow Naomi and to Naomi's God, the God of Israel. For the ancient reader, hearing the story right away, they would likely be surprised. This isn't a story about Elimelech, the male head of the family. He gets killed off right away. This isn't a story about political leaders or military victories. In fact, I'll warn you in advance, there are no miracles in this story, no magic, no battles, no heroes with superpowers. Nothing out of the ordinary. This is a story about to women, and not just any women, but widows, one old and one young and a foreigner. In ancient Israel, widows, orphans, and foreigners were among the most marginalized social categories. 
In a patriarchal society, women needed male relatives for security and income. Widows or orphans were left helpless. Naomi recognizes that she will not be able to provide protection to Ruth and encourages her to stay in her homeland and return to her family. But Ruth makes a surprising choice. She tells Naomi, I'm going with you. This choice will put Ruth at an even greater disadvantage than being a widow. She will now be a foreigner. Foreigners were often exploited and oppressed. Over and over again in the Old Testament, God is reminding his people to stop exploiting foreigners. Exodus 23, 9, you shall not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 10. God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Ruth, in choosing to go with Naomi to Israel, is now in a position of both deep vulnerability and incredible agency as she makes the decision to go with her mother-in-law. This introduction of Ruth and Naomi as protagonists in this story tells us something that is important for us to understand and easy to miss as modern readers. God sees women. Even in a patriarchal world, the God of Israel saw women. God sees women as agents in their own stories. God hears the cries of women. God sees the marginalization of women, the injustices done to women. For all of the women here today, hear this truth. God always has and always will value the lives of women. No matter where we turn in scripture, the Old Testament or the New, we encounter a God who sees women and has compassion on them, who empowers them, and who invites them into mission. We see this from the very beginning when God creates Eve, the first woman. Both Adam and Eve are created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. We see this with Jesus' interactions with women. When Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, she has such a powerful encounter with Jesus that she becomes a missionary to her hometown, telling them to come and see this man who knew everything about her. So women, no matter what we've been told by the church or the culture, we are full participants in the kingdom of God. We are agents in our stories. We are written into the story of God's redemptive work in the world. The story continues in chapter 1, verse 22. So Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, go my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. And as it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. They answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, to whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and has been on her feet from early morning until now without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I've ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Imagine the vulnerability of these two widows, unable to make a living in their society. The best they could do was follow the farm workers and pick up any leftover grain. 
a practice that was mandated by God to the people of Israel to protect the most vulnerable in society, to ensure that no one would ever go hungry. It was the national welfare system of the day. But it was not easy to work, and it was, it's hard to imagine how Naomi would have eaten if this young, able-bodied Ruth had not come along to labor in the fields. Ruth proves herself to be a hard worker, standing out to the reapers with her diligence. Notice what Ruth is called here, Ruth the Moabite. Repeatedly, she is labeled as a foreigner, an outsider. While she easily could have been overlooked, Ruth the Moabite was seen. Boaz notices this foreign woman in his fields and inquires as to her identity. Rather than remaining hidden, Ruth is seen. The foreigner is seen. Widows and foreigners were the most outcast in society, so the fact that this book is in our Bible should give us pause. Even when society overlooks women and the marginalized, God does not. They are being written into God's story. We are being written into God's story. The book of Ruth is the only book in the canon named after a non-Israelite. Yahweh is the God of Israel and his people, but Ruth, a Moabite, becomes one of his people. Yahweh's special relationship with his people was never meant to be exclusive, but a picture of God's love for the nations. As I was reflecting on this passage, I couldn't help but think about what it's like to be a foreigner in the U.S. today. I found myself an incredible, diverse, international community over this last decade since coming to Seattle. I can't personally claim to have experienced what it feels like to be a foreigner here, but I've had the gift of hearing many stories and the perspectives of my friends who have come here as international students and scholars. While there are many kinds of stories and many kinds of experiences, one theme that I've heard quite often is the theme of feeling not fully seen or invited into full participation. I recall one brilliant friend lament that she couldn't get scholarships as a non-citizen, that all financial aid was out of the question for her, and that she had to pay an even higher tuition than local students. She felt seen only as a source of revenue for an institution. I've heard many stories of graduate students being mistreated by their advisors because they knew that students would be too afraid to report them and risk having to leave the country. I've known friends who are treated as unintelligent due to their accents, despite being scholars in their fields. In so many ways, international students and scholars are often marginalized and mistreated for the advantage of dominant culture. So for all of us who feel unseen, who have been the foreigner or the marginalized, for all of my international friends who are hearing this right now, know that our God is a God who sees. And God looks at the foreigner with love and compassion and invites the foreigner into family. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the U.S.-Mexico border in Tijuana through an organization called Global Immersion. Global Immersion took a group of us from UPC to learn about the biblical call to be peacemakers and to think about how to put into practice in some of the most divided places, tackling some of the most thorny issues. We met U.S. border guards and heard their hearts for keeping the country safe. We met activists who would bring water to people who were trying to illegally cross the border. We met mothers in Mexico who had been deported and were separated from their children in the U.S. We met deported veterans who had fought for the U.S. military but were denied citizenship, and many more. Issues around the border and immigration are complex. But one story that has stayed with me ever since then was from a girl who was college-aged around the age of the students that I worked with here at the church. She was a dreamer a young woman who had been born outside of the U.S. and had come as a young child before she could remember and was undocumented. She shared the fear that she had growing up of being noticed, that somehow she and her family would be seen and sent away to a country she had never known. When we think about the dynamics of what it means to be seen, there's a certain risk entailed in being seen. For a foreigner, there can be danger in being both seen and unseen. Ruth here is at risk as a foreign woman being seen in the fields. Note that Boaz has to warn the men not to give her trouble. A lone woman would be an easy target for all kinds of mistreatment. But Boaz sees Ruth, and his sight is full of compassion and kindness. 
a picture of God's compassionate seeing. He warns her to stay close to the other women and not go into any other fields outside of his protection. In response, the story continues. Then Ruth fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, may I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. Boaz sees Ruth's kindness towards her mother-in-law and is impressed. He recognizes the risk she has taken to leave her native land and her family of origin. He prays that the Lord would reward her. An interesting fact about the book of Ruth is that God is not a very active character in the story in any visible way. God is mentioned frequently, but we see little reference to God taking any direct action. We don't hear the story from God's perspective. There's no voice from heaven telling us God's thoughts about what is happening. And yet this story shows us, perhaps more than any other book in the Bible, about the loving kindness of God. We meet the God of Israel in this story as he works silently behind the scenes. And the God that we meet in this story is characterized by one Hebrew word, hesed. Hesed is translated as kindness, but is actually a more complex concept. It's a relational term that combines the many attributes of God, love, grace, mercy, kindness, goodness, covenant faithfulness. It could be translated loving kindness. We encounter the word has said three times in the book of Ruth. First in Ruth 1.8. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly, has said, with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. We first see that God is described with Hesed, that God is the origin and source of loving kindness. This is the nature of God. We meet in the book of Ruth a God who sees and is characterized by loving kindness. Here Naomi calls on the God of Israel to show his loving kindness to her Moabite daughters-in-law, trusting that his loving kindness extends to those outside of the covenant community of Israel, that God extends Hesed to foreigners. The second reference to Hesed is in Ruth 2.20. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he, Boaz, by the Lord, whose kindness, Hesed, has not forsaken the living or dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. When Ruth returns from the fields of Boaz with an abundance of food, Naomi is reminded of God's loving kindness expressed through the generosity of Boaz. Here, Naomi recognizes not just the generosity of Boaz, but that Boaz is their nearest relative. He is, according to Israelite tradition, their goel, or kinsman redeemer. To protect the most vulnerable, the Israelite people had complex kinship rules. The kinsman redeemer is a legal term connected to Israelite family law. The role of kinsman redeemer would be activated when a relative is in distress. This role ensured that the property would stay in the family and that relatives would be protected. The custom of redemption looked to the wholeness and health of an entire community, not just individual interests. The final reference to Hesed is in Ruth 3.10. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty, Hesed, is better than the first. In chapter 3, Boaz refers to the Hesed of Ruth. Ruth has shown Hesed in her loyalty to her mother-in-law. Ruth has, through her devotion to Naomi, put herself in a potentially compromising situation at the feet of Boaz in the middle of the night on the threshing floor. Boaz recognizes that she has come in loyalty to her mother-in-law, not to seduce him, but to come in vulnerability to ask for protection as kinsman redeemer. God's said, God's loving kindness is expressed through people in the context of personal life, family life, community life. Our lives are characterized by God's said when we look out for the welfare of others. Think about how each character in this story, Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, they were all looking out for the best of one another. 
The care that we see here is mutual and transformative. Ruth is there for her mother-in-law at the most painful time in her life. Naomi at the beginning of the story says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. And by the end of the story, we see a complete transformation in Naomi's life from suffering to joy, from being characterized by the loss of her children to having people say, a son has been born to Naomi. And Naomi is there for Ruth, looking out for her best interests, guiding her to stay in the field of Boaz where she will be safe, and even proposing a plan to call on Boaz to step into his role as a kinsman redeemer to the family. Naomi is looking out for Ruth, but Naomi in turn needs Ruth to survive. Their love and care is mutual and transforms them both. We see the kindness of Boaz as he protects Ruth in his fields, and eventually as he steps into the role of the protector of the family through marriage. We are more fully able to see the loving kindness of God through the kindness of each of these characters in the story. God is characterized by kindness, and the people who follow God should be known by their kindness as well. A few days ago, I stumbled across an article in Christianity Today with the provocative title of Loving the Foreigners Even When They Have a Deadly Disease. The article shared the story of the spread of COVID among migrant workers in Singapore. Most migrant workers in Singapore are from India and Bangladesh, but also Malaysia, Myanmar, and Thailand, working in construction or other low-wage jobs. It's common for migrant workers to live in dense communal housing, and at the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak in 2020, the migrant workers in Singapore were particularly hard hit. In April 2020, Singapore had a lockdown, and many migrants were unable to work and struggled to eat as they could not go out with COVID spreading in their community and food delivery became unavailable to them. But the Christians in Singapore saw the plight of the migrant workers. Their suffering did not go unnoticed. Christians started what would initially be a single day of food delivery. They grew into a four-month operation starting on Good Friday, 2020. On that first day, they served 10,000 meals and discovered that many of the migrant workers hadn't eaten for days. They have now delivered over 1 million meals, serving over 21,000 migrant workers, and deep friendships have formed through what began as simple meal delivery. Singaporean pastor Guo Liang Wang reflected, Migrant workers have been an immense blessing to us here in Singapore in more ways than one, and the least we can do is to show them the love of Christ by supporting and encouraging them through this crisis. As one volunteer was searching the city, trying to find some of the hidden dormitories of migrant workers, he found five men sitting under a tap of water by the road. It turned out that these men hadn't eaten in three days, and all they had was the water from the tap to drink. When the volunteer arranged food for him, they told him, without you, we would have died. Thank you so much. Now we know that we have family in Singapore. Through the loving kindness and action through the Christian community, these foreigners not only had their basic needs met, but found family. When we live out God's said, there is mutual blessing and transformation. This is what the church in action looks like. The story of Ruth concludes in chapter 4. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Lest we be tempted to think that this is simply a happy ending for some nice people who deserved it, this story points to an even bigger story. We see that the child born to Ruth and Boaz will be the grandfather of the great King David. This is the surprise ending of the book. These three ordinary people get written into God's story of redemption in the world. Ruth, a widow and a foreigner, becomes the great grandmother to the great King David. Ruth and Boaz are brought into the family of God and written into the lineage of David and ultimately Jesus. 500 years after this story, 
the New Testament opens with the announcement of the fulfillment of this promise to another young woman who found favor with God. Luke 1, 26, in the, next month of, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary's child is Ruth's great, great, great grandchild. This is the good news of the gospel. To put it very simply, God sees, God is kind, and God is bringing us into his family. We may feel like Naomi did in this story, that God is frustratingly silent. We don't get any answers in the book of Ruth why the famine happened in Israel that forced them to migrate. We don't know why Naomi's husband and sons died. Their suffering and pain is real. And yet behind the scenes, a good and loving God was working to make things right, was working to pull these women into a story bigger than their own. No matter where we are at in our stories right now, even if we are at our lowest points, the unshakable truth is that God sees you and that God is full of loving kindness. He's inviting each one of us today to accept that kindness into our lives, to turn towards him and to allow him to fill us with his love. God wants to write each one of us into his story. And the story of God is one of the ultimate kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. In the ultimate act of God's loving kindness, God entered into our human story and sent his son Jesus Christ as the redeemer of all human history. The same God of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz is inviting each one of us today into the family of God to be a part of his story of redemption in our world. As we come to a close with the sermon, here are a few applications for you to ponder. Pastor Aaron always says, every Ruth needs a Naomi and every Naomi needs a Ruth. Who is the Ruth in your life? Who is your Naomi? Just like the story of Linda and Claire in the video earlier, there may be someone that God has put in your life that you can care for and who can care for you. What would it look like to cling to them and stick with them in difficult times? How are you experiencing the loving kindness of God through them? If someone doesn't come to mind right away, perhaps it's time to start looking and asking God for eyes to see. The second question is, what next step do you want to take in response to the God's character of loving kindness? Every one of us needs a kinsman redeemer. Ruth comes in humility before Boaz, trusting that he will take care of her. She depends on his character. We can depend on the character of God and come vulnerably before our loving God. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, come today with honesty and vulnerability and put your trust in his trustworthiness. There's no one who will ever love you more, who will sacrifice more for you. Jesus has already sacrificed himself for you. Scripture tells us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ has died for you and for me. He offers us a new life, a life of fulfillment and purpose, a full participation in the family of God. Through Jesus Christ, we are no longer foreigners or widows, but brothers and sisters in the family of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your loving kindness towards us. We thank you that you see us even in our lowest moments and love us. We thank you, God, that you see the marginalized, the foreigner, the oppressed. And we ask for your eyes to see those who are hurting around us. Fill us with your chesed and mold us, your church, into a community characterized by loving kindness lived out through our actions. May we be your hands and feet in this broken and hurting world, Jesus. We give our lives to you, our loving God. Amen. Friends, in response,